extra knock shot at the University of Aberdeen. As you can see, I've got two quarters for my colleagues, uh, also with Kerry and Kate Britton, who couldn't make it to the conference, so I'm presenting on their behalf, and uh, they are environmental carers and high school specialists. Um, so the goal of this talk is to introduce some of the biomedical techniques that are used in archaeology that we've been using in Aberdeen, um, and to demonstrate how these can feature in research um, driven by uh, funded work, museums or local authorities, and high collaborations with university-based uh, researchers. And hopefully this can be mutually beneficial and uh, overall um, be better to, to the discipline and increasing our knowledge of the past. Uh, so in addition to um, zooarchaeology and osteoarchaeology, Uh, yes, with a vast uh, array of uh, more advanced biological approaches that have been developed in the last 10, 20 years, and in particular biomolecular uh, approaches, uh, we can apply to human and animal remains, but also sediments. Um, so, I've got a few here that you've already heard of, organic so tissue analysis, uh, isotopes, which we've focused on all day, uh, metabolomics, uh, zooms in proteomics, and uh, ancient uh, DNA. So I'll give a very brief overview of some of those methods, um, but it's the main ice that I'll be talking about. Um, so an important new method uh, or technique uh, has been in more and more space in our of research has been proteomics and uh, zooms in particular. So this is um, the study of ancient uh, proteins, mainly collagen, as they extracted from bone, uh, even metal culture or in residue as well. Um, it's used a lot for species identification, uh, but it's also been used for reconstructing past food ways, uh, diseases, health, and more recently there's been attempts to identify uh, sex in, in bone uh, using proteomics. It's also been used in conservation, so there's quite a, a vast uh, possibility to apply uh, proteomics. Um, one of the probably most common methods that you probably have all heard about is um, so our archaeology by mass spectrometry and that uh, sort of zooms. And that allows us to do species identification um, of bone, uh, in particular when you've got small fragments that cannot be identified by uh, visual archaeologists, for example. Uh, the uh, key takeaway if you like, for about this method is that all you need is a small sample size. Uh, it's uh, relatively quick, it's very cheap, um, and it's minimally disruptive in some cases, or small almost non-destructive as you can't see the impact on the naked eye, just to the microscope to see where the sample was taken. Okay. Right. And proteins are more robust than DNA, so that's not so bad to work with proteins. Um, DNA, uh, I'll just cover briefly into DNA, um, also helps to identify species. Obviously, it's got much wider applications. Uh, you can look at things like kinship or relatedness between individuals. Uh, you can investigate diseases, um, and now uh, we're able to extract DNA from sediments. And this is actually an area that's growing very rapidly in, in archaeology. Um, so I'll just give a quick word on sedimentary in DNA, known as sedder DNA. So this is a genetic material that's extracted from sediments, um, and it's a powerful tool uh, for archaeologists to reconstruct past environments, uh, look at biodiversity, uh, or even past human activities. So the issue here is that we don't really necessarily know that we need the samples to set the DNA until much later. So once the expedition is completed, and once you've got car park on your site, and there's no way of returning. Um, set the DNA only requires small samples, um, and unlike uh, the larger bulk samples that we take from other domains or for dating, uh, storage is not really an issue in terms of set the DNA samples, uh, though they do need to be stored in a cold environment, so cold storage could be maybe problematic in some some organizations. And actually, uh, we've done a bit of it uh, on the last site. It doesn't take too much time to sample, so it's not uh, too time consuming. Uh, so, the state day sampling is something we should perhaps consider including into some of our exploration standards, um, just as other sampling that we do. And it seems it could, and you're obviously a fair place now to answer this question, but it seems that it could be feasible to include in a commercial setting. 
uh, though that might miss, you know, remains to be seen, maybe, but um, ice is worth asking the question if it, if it should be included. Uh, metabolomics, I'll be very brief on metabolomics, it's kind of a new kid on the block. Uh, we'll hear more about it in the next couple of years, it's still very early stages. I think we still have uh, a lot of problems in terms of uh, techniques. Uh, but you can do some really interesting things with metabolomics. You can explore things like uh, past drug use or tobacco use. Uh, you can look at health here in the of So, uh, quite some exciting possibilities for metabolomics. And uh, ice dogs. Um, so, probably the best in biomedical um, and techniques uh, that's used in archaeology is also probably the most commonly applied to non university led uh, projects. And it includes the chemical analysis of teeth and bone, both in animals and in humans. And uh, you can look at, if you're looking at teeth, you can look at diet in younger age or childhood. Or you can also look at uh, what people lived. Um, again, if you're looking at teeth as in childhood, you can look at things like age of weaning as well. Um, and if you're looking at uh, bone rather than teeth, it's the same question, the same uh, kind of approach. You're looking at diet and residency, but in the later years of life. Uh, and of course, these can be applied to both animal and human remains, and you can ask kind of similar questions about mobility and diet. Um, so, I think some widely used in research, and the costs are going down. Um, and what's important here is that um, ISO data is generated with very low carbon dates for when you're dating bone, uh, you will be getting uh, ISO data. Um, so, obviously, the specialists in universities uh, in particular who can help interpret that data. Um, and it's something my colleagues Kate and Alfie uh, do on a regular basis working with uh, archivists outside of uh, academia. So in a nutshell, how do ice books work? Um, so basically, it's, it's, it's uh, from the principle that you are what you eat. Um, so you look at chemical signatures in tissues, and that can tell uh, us about your dietary habits uh, or where you grew up. So ice books are different versions of the same elements. Uh, and what we're looking at is the ratios between uh, different uh, isotopes. So here you've got a, so the most common, sorry, the most common isotope ratios that you'll hear about are carbon and nitrogen, um, and they're used to investigate diet in humans and animals. So the graph here is kind of idolized uh, carbon nitrogen food web for Northwest Europe. Um, and you can see here the, the spread of the different animals based on what they eat. And you can see, for example, marine mammals at the top are high in nitrogen and they're high in carbon, whereas the herbivores are low in carbon and low in nit nitrogen. So you can see uh, in light of this variation in the food web that if you look at the carbon nitrogen from human remains, you can kind of infer the diet of past human populations. Um, so carbon is used to determine, uh, to look at the marine input in the diet. Um, and nitrogen is more to look at the trophic level. So, you know, determining is whether you're an omnivore, so not a carnivore, or if you're a vegan or um, a herbivore. So, bone collagen gives you kind of average diet um, for the last 10 years of life. And if with a teeth, you can get high resolution mainly uh, during early, early years of, uh, of life. So, these techniques are applied to track bone collagen, and as I said, uh, of course, it's, it's that cause that you're dating when you're sending for great carbon dating. So this means it's probably people that are uh, sitting on some ice data without really knowing. Um, and uh, many great carbon dating labs will give you nitrogen and carbon with your date. And for uh, an added fee, uh, for us at Stuart, it's about £30, pounds, you can get sulfur, so you can get other ice data for uh, relatively small fees. Um, so if you do you realize you are sitting on some ice data that came with your dates, uh, you can get in touch uh, with uh, Oshi and Kate, and I was happy to help uh, with the interpretation. So, other popular uh, isotopes are strontium and oxygen, and they're used for mobility studies. And here we're uh, working with teeth, and again, we're looking at kind of the teeth for early years uh, of, of life. And strontium uh, is based on related to the underlying pathology, and oxygen is to do with chemistry in drinking and water, so it keeps things simple. Uh, and if we look at the environmental variability of these two systems, uh, we can kind of predict it across the landscape and, and generate what we call an isoscape. Uh, so this is the map we've got on the right. It's the 
across the Elsie and Ice Cave of Scotland, that was generated by uh, Kate. Um, and you can see here, once you've got the, uh, the data from human remains for that whole animal uh, bone nice data, you can kind of map it and uh, get an idea if your individuals are local or not, or even maybe where they came up. So that's the kind of principle behind using structural analysis from isotopes. So, um, isotopes uh, research, and like other biological research, is usually kind of question, dri question driven, or it can be material driven, or often a bit of both. Uh, so, like all archaeologists, we're, we're always looking for new questions. Um, that's about the past, or we're trying to ask old questions. And obviously, yes, at university, we're always looking for new projects for students. So we're always on the look for new materials. So I'm going to call out if you do have these initial uh, use of this kind of work, then please get in touch. Uh, commercial firms and um, uh, developed funded work, local authorities, museums play a vital role not in only in finding samples, uh, but also the next one generating most of the discoveries. And uh, they can come across materials that open all new lines of inquiry. So, such collaborations with university-based researchers uh, can feed into bigger research projects, uh, but they'll also be just standard projects as well. We've done a bit of both at Abbey. So here you've got a section of various outputs of Abbey of work in ourselves and uh, our close base outside of academia. And I'm just going to rapidly two uh, of those projects. So the first one is at Clamon near Edinburgh. So this is with uh, John. Um, and it was the work is dictated and part funded by the local authority and has produced some really interesting results. So, for those of you who don't know the site of Hammond, uh, it's got rich archaeological records in the Medal effect uh, all the way through to uh, the High Medieval period. Uh, the project was issued by John. Um, and it's in regards to the unusual burials that were found in the actions of the Roman fort. Um, and they were really thought to be from the kind of High Medieval period, and after they were really accommodated, it turned out to be. Uh, early medieval and dates from the 5th, 6th century AD. Uh, so that can represent a rare opportunity to explore diet and mobility of people in Scotland uh, during that period. Um, so my colleagues looked at the nine adult girls and um, they turned out to have quite a typical early medieval diet, uh, mostly uh, consisting of dairy products and meat. But we got the biggest surprises when we looked at the strontium and uh, isotope data. So here you've got the plot. So you can see most of the adults are considered locals, and we've got two very clear uh, outliers. So we have a male um, here, and a young male, and he probably came from Peoplesshire or South Ashur, or even the area surrounding Dr. Pillman, so it's the light blue uh, on the map, on the landscape. And we also had a woman uh, in her 40s, uh, probably, uh, that seemed to have much more westerly origins. Um, and this is suggested by the oxygen, oxygen values you can see. So she's the one on the left there. You can see her oxygen values are much higher than uh, the locals. Um, so she could have come from the inner Hebrides, maybe the Isle of Skye, uh, possibly Northern Shetland. Uh, but we can't exclude further afield. That's kind of the limitations uh, of this kind of work. She could have come from County Antrim, maybe Cornwall or Somerset. So uh, it's not exact see this location where she came from, but at least it kind of feeds into this emerging pattern we have uh, from early medieval sites in Scotland, that there was there seemed to be a significant movement of people from west to east uh, at that time. Um, so this work featured in an exhibition um, at the Museum of Edinburgh and was published, uh, so it showed kind of both academic and public impact uh, of this work. Uh, the second and last project, it was looking at the uh, Abdus Medieval Friars, and this was enabled by the vast quantities of sculptural remains that we have now that went through various excavations for the last decades. Um, there's been a series of mini projects, a uh, kind of mix, of mix of developer and historic environment Scotland fund, funding, uh, and well supported by uh, the Council of Archaeologists as well. So, Aberdeen uh, was a bustling medieval burr uh, and had at least four monastic orders. Uh, houses and so some straight like the Franciscans and some more orders like the uh, Dominicans and Carmelites. Uh, so the research was initiated by my colleagues at the department uh, with the local museum and uh, it was kind of based on development uh, led work. So mainly, well, part of it was the AOC excavations at the new um, Alinar Gallery. Uh, and this has allowed us to 
grow small projects and be much bigger to get a better view of religious life uh, in Aberdeen. So there was a mixture of dietary and mobility work uh, done. So here you've got uh, all the individuals uh, from all the communities plotted on, on the map. And you can see uh, the dietary uh, diversity. Uh, we did a little mixing line. Uh, you can see some have a low marine diet and some have a much higher marine diet. Um, and it's kind of the idea you get middle cities that's a bit of a dietary melting pot. Uh, but just to mention uh, the friars, which seem to be very fishy in terms of their diet, and it's probably them adhering to fasting uh, rules. But we also have this weird Dominican. So if you remember, um, I said about carbon nitrogen, when it's low values, it's probably uh, more herbivore uh, based diet. So uh, this person pretty much like a herbivore, so we get really excited and we thought that maybe we had a medieval vegan. Uh, but this was done with uh, actually a small piece of bread. So just to be hard to ensure we use zooms, as I mentioned, the cheap and easy way to get a species ID. Uh, and it turned out to actually be just a cow. Uh, so we were excited for a couple of weeks and then uh, it turned out to be a cow. But I guess the, the takeaway from this is, well, we're not too sure how a very small fragment of a cow would end up perfectly in the ribcage of a, in a human burial. Bit of a mystery. Um, but I think it shows the importance of combining some of these uh, these new methods. And the last uh, slide I, I want to show you here. So we did some higher resolution in some people's teeth uh, to get diet to change uh, through life. So this is for the Franciscans. This is one individual. You can see the page uh, on the bottom uh, axis here. Uh, and here, what was fascinating is uh, from the age of roughly 12, you, you get that really kind of fishy diet that kicks in. So this is probably when uh, this person joined the uh, Franciscans. So hopefully uh, these examples of research been driven by work um, in the commercial sector, in collaboration with the uh, local authority and uh, the university, uh, provide good examples of what we can do um, and how it uh, really helps understand uh, the past a bit more. And uh, this type of collaborative research, uh, I think, it contributes to kind of the social value of archaeology, what we were discussing yesterday in the opening uh, lecture. And uh, notably, when it, notably when it leads to museum exhibitions, for example, or um, other public engagement uh, activities. Uh, so in terms of concluding thoughts, uh, so biomedical techniques uh, have a lot of promise. Um, some of these examples do bring on site uh, challenges. Um, after work in unusual settings can be a huge driver for research, advancement, and innovation. I think that's a really an important point. Uh, and collaborations can take many forms. They can be one-off as well. They can be large-scale endeavors. Uh, it can lead just to maybe a, a simple uh, or a, a unique site in report or to publications. And it actually feed into uh, building much bigger research projects as well. Um, so this is part of this time benefits from these collaborations in the corporate team, the commercial sector, and universities, and as I said, uh, we to the social value of archaeology. And um, we believe that awareness of these methods is really key. Uh, we're not specialists, but if we know they exist, we know roughly how they work. So think of what I said about the set of DNA on site, the low cost of zooms, um, which I think is really, really important as well. Um, so rather than having uh, some animal bone from site or bone from a site, and so it does, you've got 1% is identifiable, it's very fragmentary. You can use them, it is really cheap, they're probably 5 to 20 pounds a sample, I think. Um, and to knowing that you already might have some data um, that you supply for your days. And so the question is kind of, I think some of these elements of biomedical archaeology could perhaps be included into projects and post situation research designs. I think it's kind of part of uh, uh, discipline standards, just like some of the other stuff that we do. Uh, here I list to um, an organization for which to thank and thank you very much for listening.